So in this video, we're going to take a look at a paper called a survey of large language model based autonomous agents. A lot of this might look boring and some of these papers are a little bit hard to read, but it's very important that you understand this. I believe that LLMs as autonomous agents is the big, big thing. If you understand why, feel free to skip to the next chapter in the video. If not, give me just 30 seconds to explain why. So more and more AI insiders are beginning to refer to AI by a very specific word. When they talk about where AI is going, they use very specific words to describe the final form this artificial intelligence will take. This is important to understand because it gives us a glimpse into where things are going. A lot of people think of AI right now as something that we use, something that we talk to, something that we prompt. Similar to an app or a piece of software, it's something that we open and we interact with it. Kind of like a hammer, it's a tool that we use to make the things that we are doing easier. AI helps us to create words and images and video and even music. By the way, if you haven't seen the AI-generated Elvis singing Baby Got Back, I think you're missing out. But my point is that AI tools empower us to do more. But there's another wave coming. And like in that movie Interstellar, it's a big one. Because while AI apps are great tools, the really important thing to grasp is that AI can build tools. It can use tools. So when the people at the forefront of AI development talk about AI and where it's headed, they're not describing it as, a, as an app or a piece of software or a system. More and more, they're referring to it as an agent, an autonomous AI agent. And we've already seen a lot of these proto-autonomous AI agents. In fact, we've covered a few of them on this channel. Voyager AI from NVIDIA, to me, is probably the best illustration of where things are headed. Voyager is an AI that was given the goal to become the greatest Minecraft player of all time, and to do as many novel and interesting things in a game as possible. It learns about the game, and it creates these little scripts for itself that it uses in the game to get better, to learn new skills and new abilities. And if those skills and abilities work well, it adds them to a skill library. It can write little code snippets, little scripts for itself, aka tools, to improve itself. It's self-improving, and it autonomously continues to try to get to its goal from just one broad prompt that a human gave it. And it does it very, very well, without hitting a plateau and continuing to get better and better as time goes on. The thing that powers this is GPT-4. It's the model behind ChatGPT. So ChatGPT is an LLM, a large language model, and these LLMs constantly seem to surprise us with their abilities. Google DeepMind uses a version of their LLM in the RT2 robot, which was a pretty massive breakthrough in robotics. It learned to generalize and learn new skills and how to navigate new situations that it has never before encountered. Another study we covered on this channel is Othello GPT, which seems to suggest that LLMs build a sort of world model, a sort of mental model about their world. They seem to develop some understanding about the world and about things that they were never exposed to. Another example of LLMs as agents was this paper called Generative Agents, where 25 AI agents, each powered by ChatGPT, this was a paper out of Stanford and Google, where they simulated kind of living in this town called Smallville, running around, going about their daily lives, and kind of working together to achieve one objective. It's a fairly simple study with some pretty massive implications. When we take these LLMs, ChatGPT is the most well-known one, but there are many, many others, and we get them to pilot something. For example, a robot like RT2, or a video game character like Voyager, or 25 separate characters like Smallville. When we create agents that are powered by LLMs, pretty incredible things tend to happen and as you'll see in just a second, more and more attention is being paid to this particular field of study. So let's dive in. So this is the paper survey on large language model-based autonomous agents. So the paper starts, previous research in this field often focuses on training agents with limited knowledge within isolated environments. This is how things used to be. And then they continue recently through the acquisition of vast amounts of web knowledge, large language models, LLMs, have demonstrated remarkable potential in achieving human level intelligence. So when you hear LLM, just think AI. It's a specific subset of AI, but this is the thing that kind of empowers a lot of this progress that we're seeing right now, LLMs. So, and their focus lies in the construction of LLM-based agents, and they're proposing a unified framework. So basically, there was a lot of different studies all trying to create their own autonomous, ag autonomous agents. We, I've showed you a few of them just now. And what this paper is doing is they're trying to kind of create a taxonomy, kind of like a layout of all the different ways that you can build these guys and what the architecture will be, like what pieces, what Lego pieces do we need to put everything together? And so autonomous agents have long been seen as a promising path towards artificial general intelligence, AGI, capable of accomplishing tasks through self-directed planning and instructions. And here they show you a little chart. Notice how it like really starts kind of like shooting up. We talked about generative agents. This is the 25, 25 agents in Smallville. Then we have Voyager AI. That's the Minecraft one. And you might have heard of things like Baby GPT and Auto GPT, which are the, so basically they've taken, you know, Chad GPT and they've had some like recursion to it. So it's 
able to kind of try to go through and complete more than one prompt at a time. So it keeps trying different stuff, keeps going instead of stopping. Now, those things are very interesting, but I'm going to go ahead and say it, maybe somewhat underwhelming in terms of what they're able to accomplish. Like they're cool demos and, and they're a cool example of where things are going, but they're not going to like blow your mind in terms of like what they can actually do. And this one right here, Agent Sims. And so this is Agent Sims, an open source sandbox for large language model evaluation. So basically, and this is interesting, they've created kind of a video game with a lot of different moving parts. So it's, it sounds like there's a map, there's various businesses, there's various characters within the businesses, etc. I haven't read this yet. Maybe we'll cover this in another video because this does look pretty interesting. They have various support systems for the agent's memory, planning, tool use system. So for example, the scripts that it can use. And it sounds like the whole point of this paper is to create a way to evaluate how good the LM models is by sort of just having them power that city and just see how well they're able to run it. And so here, for example, they can do subject LM as participants. So this is interesting. So when we have new LMs that we're testing, evaluating, let's say the participants of an artificial scenario where we want to evaluate their social abilities. In that case, we can create specific social scenes by using stronger LMs to create the scene and then testing sort of the weaker or the newcomer LMs on them. So for example, to study a new model of social adaptation abilities in a hostile environment, we can embed colleague agents driven by GPT-4 with a strong desire of bullying newcomers. Then we place the subject agents into this adversarial milieu and test whether the new model can understand others' emotions and improve how colleagues perceive it. I, I would pay to see that. Or for example, we can use the LM as the mayor of the city to see how well they're able to govern and run things. And the residents or employees are driven by baseline agents like GPT-4. We might do this paper at a different time because it sounds fascinating. Jun Sung Park, I believe, is the guy behind, yeah, he's the guy behind, um, he's, he's one of the researchers behind the Smallville experiment, the generative agents um, out of Google and Stanford. It looks like he has multiple references here. Anyway, so that's Agent Sims. Let's get back to the paper. Uh, in recent years, large language models have achieved remarkable success, indicating their potential for achieving human-like intelligence. And so a burgeoning trend has emerged in recent years. So this is where everyone's headed. Where LLMs are harnessed as core orchestrators in the creation of autonomous, autonomous agents. So this is what I'm saying. They pilot the thing. That's that's kind of what I'm saying. They're the at the core of everything. They're, they're the controller. They're the operator of the agent. Again, this is interesting because it's so new that we don't have a lot of the words for this yet. So as this field grows and more people kind of get into it, we're probably going to have specific words to describe each portion of this. And so they're saying this strategic employment aims to emulate human-like decision-making processes, thereby providing a pathway towards more sophisticated and adaptive artificial intelligence systems. And so this is where they get into the agent construction. So kind of like when you're building something like this, what parts do you need to have to really get this thing going? So for agent construction, we present a unified framework composed of four components. So they're saying there's going to be four components, a profile module, a memory module, a planning module, and an action module. And here's a GitHub link where you can keep track of the studies in this field. I'll link it down below, unless I forget. And so the other parts of the paper, they're going to talk about how to evaluate LMs as well as how to improve them. So for example, here, there's three different strategies and how to learn the parameters of this architecture. So I think here they're saying how to make the AI agents learn better. And so for that, one, they can learn from examples. So where we kind of fine tune it, where we give it examples from certain data sets that we have that we know contains good data, and we give that to the models to learn from, aka fine tune them. Two, learning from environmental feedback, leverage real-time interactions with observations. So in the Voyager AI, what's really cool about that is it's learning from environmental feedback. It's getting feedback from the game of Minecraft and it's using that to improve its skills, to improve its abilities, to reason what to do next, etc. And three, learning from human feedback, capitalizing on human expertise and intervention for refinement. What's fascinating here, I think, is that there's actually, since this paper was released, there's, uh, I would say, a fourth one that's been announced. Or at least I think DeepMind published a paper that kind of goes over a new approach to training and improving these models. And that is, so R-L-A-I-F, Scaling Reinforcement Learning from Human Feedback with AI Feedback. And I haven't had a chance to look at this yet, so I apologize if I'm getting things wrong. But basically, if I understand correctly, so we've had reinforcement learning from human feedback. So it's where a human would say, this is good, this is bad. You know, you hit thumbs up if you like it and thumbs down if you don't like it, kind of like the standard sort of training for you know, when we're talking about human feedback for, for these models. But obviously, gathering this human preference label is a key bottleneck, aka it's a pain in the butt. And so basically what they're trying to do is like, can we get the AI to grade itself? Can we have the AI train itself? Or, you know, one model of the AI that's taught how to sort of simulate human feedback to train another model. But I think the point is that furthermore, when asked, when, they, when human beings rated the two different ones from AI or human 
where we're, we're, we're humans trained versus AI trained. And humans prefer both at equal rates. So it seems to be like you could really do that and replace AI feedback with human feedback, and it's totally fine. So AI feedback gets very competitive results. So that's interesting. So here I would actually add four, you know, have AI graded, right? So which is getting more and more interesting because it sounds like just how you make AI better is just you let it do more and more and more and more and you let it train itself and improve itself and then and then evaluate itself, et cetera, which is kind of fascinating to think about. And next, they're actually going to talk about the actual architecture of how to build these agents. So the first one is the profiling module. So this is where you tell the LM, the AI, what it is and what it's doing. Now, this is very common. It's something that you can actually try yourself with ChatGPT or something like that. Start by telling it what role it's playing. So for example, you can say you are an outgoing person or you are an introvert person. ChatGPT, when you're chatting with it, I think it actually has kind of like a like a systems prompt, like an initial prompt that it gets that you don't see, but it's there. And I think it's like the developers started by saying you are a helpful chat assistant. So that's the role that it's playing with you when you're talking to it. It's like, I'm a helpful chat assistant. And that's why it's like answering your questions, doing all that stuff. They're sort of saying the different ways that you can sort of create these profiles for the AIs. And so the first one is the handcraft method. That's where you just type it in, right? You're saying you are a helpful chat assistant or you're a customer service agent, et cetera. And they're saying, look, in general, handcrafting, it's it's very flexible, right? You can do whatever you want. You can specify exactly what needs to happen, et cetera. However, it can be very labor intensive, particularly when dealing with a large number of agents. And they mentioned the generative agents, the Smallville experiment, where they actually wrote out like a backstory for every single one of the 25 characters. So one of them, if I believe, was like Johnny Lynn. And they said, Johnny Lynn, you have a wife and her name is something Lynn. And you have a son and his name is something Lynn. And you love your family and you work at the pharmacy. And this is, you know, and they gave him sort of a backstory that he then just went and executed. And so that LM model like woke up every morning and said hi to the wife and the kid and then went to work. He generated a whole life based on that initial prompt. So that's, I guess, profiling is um, sometimes referred to as the initial prompt in, in other locations. So, and the next one is the LLM generation method. So obviously this is more just you automatically generate profiles and this can save a significant time if you have a lot of different agents, but of course it can lack precise control over generated profiles and how you can set up the LLM to kind of generate these profiles is you can give it sort of these uh, sort of initial seed agent profiles, right? Here's an example one, example two, here's, you know, a couple different examples of how they should look like, and then it tries to replicate those. And then next is the data set alignment method. So here you'd be doing them based on some real world data set. So it's kind of custom tailored to the real world data set, the real world thing that is needed to happen. And so the agent profile is created based on that. And so this is, um, again, they're illustrating the kind of unifying framework of uh, the architecture. So we have the, the profile, the memory, the planning, and then the action. And so right now we're going over the profiles. Those are the three ways that they've talked about how, do you, how you can create these profiles. And so the next is the memory module. And it plays a very important role in the construction of AI agents. So it stores information perceived from the environments and leverages the recorded memories to facilitate future actions. So this actually played a pretty big role in this uh, generative agents here, where they actually created a what they called a memory stream that allowed each and every single agent to memorize things that they found important. And they actually found that later recalling certain memories and kind of analyzing them actually improved their ability to make better decisions moving forward. And this is an example of what that looks like. So the memory stream is a lot of, and, and mostly useless, boring information. Like when uh, Isabella walks into a room, she found that, that there's nobody at the desk. There's nobody at the bed. There's nobody at the closet, right? It's just, they're not being used kind of useless information, right? But what happens is all of this is taken into sort of another module, I guess, or another place where she assigns every single memory on a scale of how important it is based on uh, recency, importance, and relevance. So how long ago did it happen? How important and how relevant it was to a particular task. And so based on that, they were able to kind of put some of these random ideas together into higher level understanding of the world. And actually here's the, how well those agents were able to execute different tasks. So as you can see here, it starts out with no architecture. It starts out worse than, than a human worker, right? But as we're adding like the planning, the reflection, et cetera, as we're adding the observation, the planning, the reflection, once we add the full architecture, it actually is better than a human crowd worker. So adding this stuff makes a big difference. And so memory structures, LM based autonomous agents usually incorporate principles and mechanisms derived from cognitive science research on human memory processes. So human memory follows a general progress. So it's basically from short-term memory to long-term memory, which is I think probably similar to what generative agents did there. But this, this can be as simple as like a notepad file, like a text-based file where it just writes down, where it juts down some basic thoughts. 
With ChatGPT, when you had custom instructions and you had Code Interpreter, you can actually create these multi-step processes where after every prompt, it saves some of its findings into a text file and then rereads that text file for the next prompt. So that is basically in a very simple way, kind of like a memory module. And of course, you can make it much more complicated, but it can be as simple as just a text file. So I'm going to skip some of the more uh, deep dives into the stuff because they talk about how the AI agents can engineer more optimized writing and reading processes, et cetera. I mean, this stuff is interesting, but if you want to read it, I, I will link the paper. So feel free to read it. We're just going to do like a high level overview. You know, another sort of way they're proposing is unified memories where, where there's a single framework and no distinction between short and long term memories. And then they talk about different memory formats, such as natural language, embeddings, databases, structured lists, et cetera. We're going to skip this because it's a little bit too detailed, but again, a very interesting read for those that want to dive deeper. And then memory operations. So three critical memory operations include reading, writing, and self-reflection. And they talk about memory writing, memory reflection. And now we get into the planning module, which again, planning, that's our kind of the third module in this. When humans face a complex task, they first break it down into simple subtasks and solve each subtask one by one. The planning module empowers LM-based agents with the ability to think and plan for solving complex tasks which makes the agent more comprehensive, powerful, and reliable. And so then we have, we present two types of planning modules. So we have planning without feedback. You know, we break it down into sub goal decomposition. So like chain of thought, where you think through things step-by-step, step. multi-path thought based on, based on COT, chain of thought. Some researchers suggest that the process of human thinking and reasoning is a tree-like structure with multiple paths to the final result, self-consistent chain of thought. So we covered something called tree of thoughts, which is a different approach where which is kind of what I think they're describing here. So they didn't use that terminology, but I think that's exactly what they're talking about. So kind of that multi-path thought where you think through several different scenarios, you kind of go, go down those branches and you see where they lead and then you come back and based on those, you find maybe like the best one to go with and you think through that one. And oftentimes, so having those like branching thoughts uh, and being able to move up and down those thoughts do help create, in some cases, something like 20x improvement in the LM's reasoning abilities. So we cover that in something called Tree of Thoughts. It's another video that we have on this channel. When I say we, that's just me. I guess it's kind of like the royal we. It's just me. I have, a, I have a video on this on this channel. And then we have external planner and then sort of the other way of doing it. So that was planning without feedback. And, and the other way of doing it is planning with feedback. When humans deal with tasks, the experience of success or failure directs them to reflect and improve their planning ability. The experiences are often obtained and accumulated based on external feedback. And so basically they're, they're, they're saying you can receive feedback from environment, humans, and other models, significantly improving the planning ability of the agents. Now, interestingly, I'm glad I, I still have this PDF up because Generative Agents 1, they did have a lot of this. They explained how they went about doing this. And uh, it's very, very relevant to this. So here, here's that John Lynn character, right? So he wakes up around 6 and completes his morning routine, which includes brushing his teeth, taking a shower, eating breakfast. He briefly catches up with his wife, main son, Eddie, before heading out to begin his day. So I think he works at the pharmacy. But as you can see here, it's kind of broken down by these 15-minute intervals. And keep in mind, none of this is scripted. So none of this is coded or scripted. No one tells them what time to wake up. No one tells them any of that stuff. This is all self-planned. And so this is the part that's interesting. So planning and reacting. So when, while a large language model can generate plausible behavior in response to situational informations, you know, they need to plan over a longer time horizon. You know, if you take an agent like Klaus and you just tell him what time it is, he might say, you know, he wants to eat lunch right at 12, but then you tell him it's 12.30, he's going to eat lunch again. You tell him it's 1, he's going to eat lunch again. So there has to be a certain planning ability. So yeah, to overcome this issue, planning is essential. And so how they approached it, so the whole thing from the top level starts with them telling the top level sort of that initial prompt or the profile prompt, as the, this paper calls it. And so basically to create such plans, to create a planning ability, our approach starts top down and recursively generates more detail. So the first step is to create a plan that outlines today's agenda in broad strokes. So to create the initial plan, we prompt the language model of the agent's summary description. So what his name is, what he does, school, or does he work, etc. And a summary of the previous day. And so they give they give them the they give them that information. They give the AI that information, and it says, okay, so wake up and complete the morning routine at 8 a.m. Go to college at 10 a.m., work on new music competition from 1 to 5 p.m., have dinner at 5.30, and then finish school assignments uh, by 11. So it breaks it up into seven pieces. So seven big rocks that, that have to be done at a certain time during the day. And then so the agent saves this plan in memory, in their memory stream, and then recursively decompose it to create finer grained actions first into, into hour-long chunks, and then eventually into five to 10-minute chunks. So that's pretty interesting, right? So it would not be able to easily break and plan its day up by, you know, five minute intervals, for example. But 
if it starts by going, okay, so what are like the big, five, the, the five big things that I have to do today? So it's these five things. All right, now let's try to break the day into our chunks and see where we can fit everything. Okay, now let's go more detail. How do we break that into 15 minute chunks and five minute chunks, et cetera. And so that kind of process, that recursive process where you keep breaking it down and rethinking it, breaking it down and rethinking it, that is the thing that produces really good results where they're able to go about their day in a believable manner, accomplish all the things that they have to do, and also even respond to new things as they come up. And all this is generated by the model. So the, the researchers just have to think about the architecture, but the model generates everything for every single one of the 25 agents. All right. And then we get to the action module, which again is number four. Our final module here is the action module. I lost my action module. There it is. And so this action module aims to translate the agent's decisions into specific outcomes. And then it directly interacts with the environment, determining the agent's effectiveness and completing tasks. This section offers an overview of the action module. And so action target means the goal of the action. And so there's a uh, task completion, dialogue interaction, and environment exploration and interaction. And so task completion, that's the fundamental goal of the action module, right? For example, Voyager, I sometimes feel bad because I bring up Voyager, that Minecraft AI, like 50 times every single video that I do. And the fact that they bring it up just as many times in this one paper makes me feel a bit better because, okay, I'm not the only one that's obsessed with it. So Voyager utilizes LM as an action module to guide agents in exploring and collecting resources. So they, they decompose an overall task into executable actions, enabling the agents to complete the routine activities step by step. Generative agents, that's the one we just looked at, similarly conducts executable action sequences by hierarchically decomposing high-level task planning. So that's what we went through. So it goes from top to bottom, breaking everything into chunks. In Voyager, they have two, well, they have at least two instances of GPT-4. One as that sort of task completion as that sort of the action module, and the other one as the code writer. So one just goes and writes code and improves it, and one sort of drives the action forward and reasons about where to go and what to do. And then we have dialogue interaction. And so they're saying LMs have to dialogue with humans because human users need to obtain the agent's status or complete collaborative tasks with agents. And then environment exploration and interaction. Agents are able to acquire new knowledge through interacting with the environment and enhance themselves by summarizing recent experiences. In this way, the agent can generalize novel behaviors so this is basically learning. Back when I went to school, they would sometimes call certain kids, what was it? I think it's kinesthetic learners. Here's a summary by Google AI. Kinesthetic learners are people who learn best through physical activity and hands-on experiences. They may have difficulty with tasks that are entirely visual in nature, such as reading a map. Tactile learners. By the way, did that seem like kind of a, a diss by the teachers and counselors towards certain kids when they called you that, kinesthetic learners? Like that wasn't a good thing, right? Anyway, so here's AIs as kinesthetic learners basically going around, interacting with the environment, and learning new behaviors and new skills through that interaction with the environment. And Voyager, again, I love that they use it so much. They conduct continual learning by allowing the agent to explore in an open-ended environment. By the way, if you didn't notice, OpenAI just recently, last week, acquired, the game is called Biomes, which is a, a open source, a massive multiplayer online RPG. That is, I mean, you can say it's a little bit of a knockoff of Minecraft, but it's, it's open source and MMORPG, like I said, but they purchased the company behind it I think in large part to have access to something that's not owned by another big company like Microsoft, because Minecraft, uh, Minecraft is part of Microsoft now. Again, because a lot of them, that's where they're all skating to. That's where all they're, they're all swimming to. The ability to create these sort of LM-powered autonomous agents and having open-sourced Minecraft-like thing that's an open world where you know millions of people can participate in, that can be very advantageous for training stuff like this. And then action strategies, so it's how to execute these steps. So there's memory recollection, multi-round interaction, feedback adjustment, and incorporating external tools. And then action space. So this is the space where, so it's the possible actions that can be performed by the agent. So if they're playing a Minecraft game, obviously it's everything that you could do with Minecraft. Then they bring up Gorilla, which is it's able to do API calls. So it's able to kind of interact with a lot of different software to try to get the functionality of that software. You know, if you have something that's answering questions or doing some sort of an office work, right? It's whatever you can do on the computer, you know, open up a browser, open up Gmail, fire off an email, go online shopping, whatever. I mean, that's where I think the stuff really gets crazy is like what happens when an autonomous agent is able to replicate most things that a human being could do on a computer. I've worked in e-commerce for the last 10 years. I've hired a lot of people, you know, that I've never met in my life very often. You know, they're virtual assistants, oftentimes from other places in the world. And sometimes I've never spoken to them over video or even audio. It's so email and chat, and they'll have a profile picture sometimes, but it's not necessary. Like you're strictly grading them based on their work. 
if they're providing excellent work, you're like, okay, you don't really need to know who that person is necessarily, as long as the work output is excellent. What happens when these autonomous agents are able to do some of that work? We're not that far away from it. And uh, that's something that's going to be kind of interesting to witness how that transition is going to happen. And so they're also talking about using external tools such as search engines, knowledge bases, computing tools, et cetera. And then 2.2 is learning strategy. And so here they kind of go through, because remember the whole point of this was to take all the sort of everybody that's building these autonomous agents and kind of like create a taxonomy, like an order of who's doing what and see what's working better, what's not. So basically, you know, for the profile module, they'll mark it as one, two, or three. And that's those things where it's, is it handcrafted? Is it generated by the LLM? Or is it database, uh, some sort of database that's applied? And so in generative agents, the Smallville experiment, it's number one. So they write out the whole backstory by hand. Then for Voyager, I think it's also written out by hand. I think this is supposed to be one because they do provide those prompts initially. And they're very long prompts about how to play the game and how to write the code, etc. So I feel like that should be one, but maybe, maybe I'm missing something. And then memory for one and two for unified and hybrid and planning one and two to present planning without feedback and with feedback. So generative agents, they do plan without feedback. So they just keep breaking it down, but there's no feedback based on it. With Voyager, there's feedback because if it writes a script that fails, it is then told, hey, you, that script failed, try again, and it tries again. What's interesting to me here is there's a lot of things on here that I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't tested. Probably, I probably know a third of these. Uh, and I do need to dive into the rest of them to see how they're doing it. But I do want to get to how they evaluate the models. So here they're talking about some of the applications that can be used with social sciences, natural sciences, engineering, you know, of course, robotics, we talked about that, creating software. So social sciences, there's tons of psychology and stuff like that, social simulation, et cetera. But yeah, it feels like this is just scratching the surface of, of the, the things they can do because this is, it can be much more than this, obviously. And so they go over in detail some of the stuff. They mentioned like having LMs uh, play out like the prisoner's dilemma, et cetera. I just did a, a video about how LMs, how ChatGPT played. If you're familiar with a game called Werewolf or sometimes it's called Mafia, or there's a video game called Among Us where you're trying to figure out who the killer is. That was, that was very interesting that you're able to play those with actual LLMs. It is a great experiment in psychology. So we'll skip some of that stuff because, I mean, they provide some very interesting examples, but we don't have time to cover all of them. And four is LM-based autonomous agent evaluation. So this is, I think, where they're proposing how to evaluate all the various agents and how well they work. So there's subjective and objective. So in generative agents, they, that was, I would say, subjective because at the end of the day, they were judged by sort of these third-party people that didn't know which one was AI, which one was humans, and, and they were graded based on how well they played. And the question was, how believable are they as human beings? And so with the full architecture, they were actually more believable than, than human beings at going about their day-to-day -day life. And so that's kind of like a subjective measure of how well they performed. And of course, with Voyager, I think it was more objective in that it was based on how quickly they passed certain metrics. Like if they built a stone axe two hours into the game or whatever, you know, that was the metric. So that was task success metrics. These metrics measure how well an agent can complete tasks and achieve goals. So success rate, reward, coverage, accuracy, et cetera or human similarity matrix like we did with generative agents. So that's it, but I am curious to know what you think. Am I correct in thinking that this is where a lot of people are going, where a lot of people are focusing their time and effort, not just here in the US and the Silicon Valley with OpenAI and Google and Microsoft and NVIDIA and all of them, but also across the world in different countries of the world, as well as the open source community that's a little bit more global. It seems like more and more people are just wondering like, where can I shove this LLM into? Like, can I shove it into home automation or can I shove it to answer emails or whatever? How many different applications of this can there be? In fact, I think one of the commenters on an early video said that he just expects for him the next 10, five to 10 years to just be selling his services of incorporating LLMs into everything. And I think that some of the examples were like, home automation, business automation, et cetera. Because this thing, based on its abilities to kind of reason, make certain decisions, and just kind of like figure stuff out and read and observe and, and plan based on that, it just seems like every little thing that we interact with could get smarter, could, be, could get better, could be a little bit more automated. And we don't need AGI for that. We don't need the much, much more advanced model. It feels like GPT-4 can do a lot of this. If not, it, then just like the very next version that comes out should be more than enough to do a lot of the, these tasks, especially when you incorporate all the other things in it, all the other architecture and give it all the tools, tools it needs, et cetera. So what do you think? Was this interesting? Are you thinking about building your own? 
I'm working a lot more content about how all of us can try to build our own autonomous agents. The interesting thing here is that you don't really need to be at the top of sort of the tech skill ladder to do some of this stuff. It feels like a lot more people are going to be utilizing this. It does seem like LM models are just a little bit more like democratic. They're a little bit more accessible to more people. And I think we're going to see some pretty remarkable things. If you made it this far, thank you for watching. You're a trooper. Please subscribe for more AI content. My name is Wes Rop. Thank you for watching.